all right, our next uh, session is the lightning talks. Um, so these were submitted abstracts that we selected uh, four from in order to give uh, quick uh, five minute discussions. Uh, there will not be time for, for questions. Um, but, uh, you know, if people have questions, they can post it and perhaps the panelists can, uh, can kind of uh, type in answers offline. So the first uh, panelist that we have, or the first lightning talk that we have today is from Ann Yoder at Duke University. Thanks, Jeff. And sorry for the, um, you know, <laughs> if I jump the gun on sharing my screen. Um, so I want to thank uh, Circulomics and Arima for the invitation. This is really exciting and the, the talks so far have been just super. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you about field genomics and biodiversity documentation in Madagascar. Um, in case you don't know, Madagascar is one of the Earth's hottest biodiversity hotspots with 80 to 90% species endemism across all groups. And um, all of it is severely threatened by human impacts. So it is a hotspot indeed. Um, so part of this uh, consequence is that species populations and their genomes are vanishing before our very eyes. And I am particularly interested in all three levels and um, I'm using genomics to uh, examine the problem. Okay, so we have as a group many goals, but here are some of our primary goals. We want to document the biodiversity and we're using, pre presently we're using a DNA barcoding approach for that. Um, we are wanting to scale up to population genomics with whole genome resequencing approaches. And very importantly, we want to transfer uh, this knowledge to the Malagasy scientific and academic community and the conservation community. Um, so uh, the example I'm going to use are, is my favorite group of organisms, uh, the mouse lemurs of Madagascar. And so these are, you're looking at six different species here, but as you will see, they uh, pretty much look the same. Um, so these are cryptic species. They're genetically highly diverged, but uh, morphologically and ecologically cryptic. Um, so to even know which animal you're looking at, uh, we are using a DNA barcoding approach with cytochrome B. And then we use that in the context of a phylogeny just to find out which lineage we are, are looking at. Um, so this is an important um, aspect of our field work. Um, and in the before times, or uh, you know, in, in the longer sense, this could take months to years to accomplish so that you know, the, the samples would be collected in the field and then we'd have to go through all of the uh, permitting issues with US Fish and Wildlife Service and then finally get the, the samples back to the lab and uh, you know, do our genomics work at that point. But we have uh, transitioned into a field genomics approach and that the first publication from that effort uh, was published this summer in conservation genetics. So we're using Oxford Nanopore and mini PCR um, technologies and taking those to the field and uh, doing the barcoding on site and finding out instantaneously which animals we're looking at. So one of our uh, field sites that we're particularly interested in is in the Southeast region of Madagascar. And this was identified back in 2009 and 2011 uh, using microsatellite data as a hybrid zone so that there was a putative gene flow uh, among uh, mouse lemur lineages in this region. Now, if you look at this uh, photograph, it looks pretty homogeneous, but if you look very closely, you will see that the uh, near this little stream, it's more of a gallery forest type of habitat, and it's much drier um, away from the stream. And what my colleague, Jorg Ganshorn, who's been working there for many years, says is that you only see Grisio rufus, which is a dry specialist in the dry forest, and murinus, which is more of a generalist in the gallery forest. They thought they were seeing hybrids between these two species. Using these microsatellite data, we have now applied RADSEQ approaches to these very same samples and found that there are no hybrids, at least not um, in this uh, data set. So we're working on this, and this is a paper that's about to come out um, on the bioarchive. Uh, and you can look at what the problems are with the microsatellite approach. Um, so 
going forward, what we want to do is, you know, as I said, take a, a population genomics approach using whole genome resequencing, but we need to start with really excellent uh, reference genomes. We have one at this point um, that was published in 2017. We kind of threw the book at it uh, using Illumina, uh, PacBio, HiC, um, uh, also optical mapping with uh, BioNano. Um, and it, you know, so it's a, pr a pretty nice genome. And amazingly, we were actually able to characterize the centromeres um, because very <laughs> randomly and accidentally, one of the NIC enzymes falls within one of the monomers of the centromere. And um, Karen, I noticed that Beth Sullivan was one of your uh, peeps in your, in your group, and she was our collaborator on this uh, project. So she verified uh, the centromeres with uh, using a fish approach. So I speak to both circulomics and ARIMA and, to, and ask you um, to help me figure out how we can do telomere to telomere sequencing uh, for small samples from small animals collected under challenging field conditions. And in fact, what brought me to this uh, symposium was uh, learning about DNA guard. Um, so I think that's going to be a very important um, tool going forward. And I, I really look forward to talking to everyone um, at both uh, companies about this. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, a lot of our work is facilitated by uh, a, a new lab that's been built in uh, Antananarivo, which is the capital city in Madagascar, Mahalayana, and the founders are, are collaborators on this project. And um, two of my, three of my co-authors on this paper, Lantu here, Lydia and Marina, um, have held several workshops uh, to demonstrate the power of the mobile lab, again, just for DNA barcoding. Um, and it's been uh, quite popular and there's a lot of excitement in the Malagasy academic community uh, for uh, incorporating genomics into their uh, field projects. So with that, I will thank my uh, collaborators and co-authors on this paper, Marina, Lydia, Fidi, Liz, Rachel, Lantu, and Peter, um, and to our funders. And I think that is it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. That was, uh, that was really interesting. And those lemurs are super cute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the curse of the cute, I call it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So actually, I forgot to mention at the beginning that these uh, the four panelists here are, are the four Lightning Talk uh, um, panelists are um, vying for a genome to be constructed by Circulomics and Arima. So. Um, you know, good luck, good luck to all, to all of the, uh, the Lightning Talk panelists. So up next, we have Ida Heyer from Uppsala University. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Ida Heyer. I'm a PhD candidate from SciLife Lab at Uppsala University. So just quickly, first want to thank Arima and Circulomics for giving me this opportunity to present some of my work here today. Uh, so I named my talk Amplification-Free Long-Read Sequencing for Detection of Cas9 of Target Activity. I think uh, most of you are familiar with the CRISPR-Cas9 system and how it's a very popular tool for genome editing. But also when we talk about CRISPR-Cas9, uh, we have to think about the off-target effects that they can cause. Um, and it's typically, it, it, an off-target effect uh, occurs when the CRISPR-Cas9 complex sits down somewhere in the genome uh, where you did not intend it to sit down and it makes uh, um, a digestion of the DNA at that spot and introduces uh, mutations. And these off-targets uh, off uh, can be predicted. It's typically done by sequence, sequence comparison. Uh, there are also some experimental tools to do this, and they usually rely on short read sequencing. Uh, so what we have done, we have developed uh, two different protocols uh, to utilize long read sequencing for detection of Cas9 off-targets. And the first one, we use PacBio and we call it smart OTS. And OTS is for off-target sequencing. 
And the other one is for Oxford Nanopore and it's called Nano OTS. I'm not gonna go into detail exactly how the, these protocol works, uh, but I just want to mention that uh, for both of them, we use uh, random fragmentation of the um, genomic DNA. And then later in the protocol, uh, we cut these molecules with the Cas9 enzyme. And when you have sequenced these molecules and, and mapped them to the reference genome, you end up with a really specific read pattern, uh, as you can see here, where all of the reads basically uh, start or end at the same uh, position. And this is how we, we can detect both the on-target and the off-target sites. And to evaluate our methods, we designed guide RNAs for 13 different targets. And uh, we detected over 100 Cas9 cleavage sites for all of these guide RNAs. And this is just an example for one of the guide RNAs targeting uh, the ATX and 10 gene. So on the left here, you have uh, the on-target site for, uh, for both of the technologies. Uh, so here you can see the Cas9 cleavage site and this really typical read pattern that we get. Uh, and on the right here, we have an example of one of the off-targets. Uh, and again, you see this same uh, read pattern as we see for the on-target. And if you compare the genomic sequence at this off-target uh, with the guide RNA, they are very similar. Uh, and for this particular off-target, we have a, a three base pair mismatch between the guide RNA and the genomic sequence. And this table just summarizes all the off-targets that we found for this particular guide RNA uh, that you have on the top, that sequence, uh, and the on-target doesn't have uh, any mismatches to that, but then you have all the off-targets uh, listed below. Uh, and for this particular one, we found five base pair mismatch uh, as the biggest difference. And to really emphasize uh, why we think long read sequencing is a good uh, approach for detecting uh, Cas9 of targets. Uh, so to demonstrate this, we designed the guide RNAs uh, that uh, towards the so-called dark spots uh, in the genome. And in this example, uh, we designed a guide RNA against the STRC gene. Uh, and when you sequence this gene uh, with the Lumina short read, uh, short reads, uh, you get a, a, uh, some spots that are, doesn't get any coverage at all. Uh, and this is also something that Everett Nall uh, showed uh, in a paper from 2019. Uh, so our guide is designed towards one of these dark regions, uh, but that doesn't affect uh, the, the outcome uh, for our sequencing. And we get this really, uh, this read pattern that we saw before, uh, that we can clearly see the Cas9 cleavage site, uh, and we also have coverage uh, over the entire locus. So this is something that we think is really beneficial uh, with using these uh, methods. Uh, and if you are a bit more interested in what I've been talking about, we have a preprint out at BioArchive that you can go ahead and check out. And with that, I just, Quickly want to thank everybody involved in this project and especially my co-supervisor Adam Amer, who did a lot of work on this project as well. Uh, and of course, Arima, Circulomics and uh, all the attendees, attendees for, for listening. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ida. Um, up next, we have uh, Mika Rotiainen. Uh, from NIH and HGRI. Okay, hi everyone. So, first some background. So, the Bruin graphs have been used for purposes such as genome assembly, read error correction, and variant calling. And the Bruin graphs are built from K mers, which are substrings of length K. Here on the right, you can see an example. So, the input sequences on the top, and in this example, k is equal to three, so all substrings of length three are extracted as k-mers, which you can see here. And then the k-mers are the nodes in the, the Bruin graph. 
So the burn graphs have traditionally been built from short Illumina reads. The reason for this is that the burn graphs require a low er read error rate. So CLR and ONT reads are usually not used with the burn graphs. But now that we have high fi reads, which have long read lengths and low error rates, we can again use the burn graphs based methods. So for this reason, we implemented MBG, which is a tool for building sparse to burn graphs designed specifically for high fi reads. And we used MBG as a part of the telomere to telomere project to assemble some of the most difficult repeat regions in the human genome. So in a sparse de Bruyne graph, instead of using all k-mers, we only use a subset of the k-mers. You can see an example here on the right. Here's the input sequence. And instead of using all k-mers, we might pick, for example, just these k-mers. Now, because the number of k-mers is smaller, we can build sparse de Bruyne graphs much faster than regular de Bruyne graphs. And we use minimizer windowing to select the k-mers, which is where the name comes from, M for minimizer and BG for the Bruin graph. So we did some experiments with MBG. First, we convert MBG to BCOM2, which is a previous tool for building the Bruin graphs. We used both tools to build graphs of E. coli from high fi reads. And I'm not going to go through these numbers, but the conclusion is that MBG is an order of magnitude faster and uses much less memory than previous methods. The reason for this is the sparse camera selection shown in the last slide. And in fact, MBG can assemble E. coli into a single contig in eight seconds. And the second experiment is that we built whole human genome graphs of HG002 using high fi reads. And the conclusion here is that MBG can build whole human genome graphs in just a few hours on a single CPU core. Finally, for more details, you can see our preprint on BioArchive and the code uh, for MBG is on GitHub, and MBG can also be installed with Bioconda. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was really interesting. Uh, on to the next uh, lightning talk. This is Brandon Pickett from Brigham Young University. All right. Um, Brandon, do you see? I'm not seeing any slides here. I saw it for a second. Yeah. Sorry, I had it for a second, and then I forgot to include the part to share sound, and now my uh, PowerPoint disappeared on me. Huh. I'm sorry about that. Um, I can share your PowerPoint if you want. I okay, up. I found it again. Sorry, I'm not sure what okay. happened, but there we go. Okay. Oh, and that's the end of it too. Gosh, I'm on top of it. <clears throat> okay. Um, my name is Brandon, and uh, I just want to share briefly some work we've been doing uh, to assemble and annotate um, a genome for the giant trevally which is a marine apex predator. <clears throat> I just want to show you one of the benefits of doing uh, non-model organisms is you get some cool pictures. So this is a picture of uh, the one that we sequenced uh, caught off the coast of Molokai in Hawaii. Uh, giant valleys can be over five feet long and up to 120 pounds. Uh, they're a really uh, popular sport fish. Um, often found throughout the Indo-Pacific, and this one in particular was caught about half a mile off the coast uh, of Molokai, uh, just outside the reef. <clears throat> Not letting me advance. Here we go. Um, I want to also show you this video of the fish being landed. It's short, but it's just kind of fun to see. <clears throat> okay, so some justification for why we're doing this work. Um, first, population declines generally in large-bodied reef-associated fish predator or predators has been declining. You can see on the graph on the right-hand side, um, the aluas or these trevallies and the populations have been declining, um, often from overfishing and habitat loss. 
um, understandably, a lot of the money and research that's gone towards fish like this, such as tuna and swordfish, uh, goes because of commercial reasons. Uh, even though these are really popular sport fish, the giant valleys, they you know don't have near the resources put at them. And any work that we've done, well, I guess I haven't done, but work that has been done in the past, uh, has been focused on uh, you know single or just a couple genes with fairly low resolution to get out population structure and whether there's hybridization between other species of valleys. Uh, so for this study that we've been working on, um, we did a, an analysis more on a genome scale, and we had 225 samples uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific where we were able to do DDRAD sequencing allows a loudest access to over 32,000 SNPs for our analysis. <clears throat> so for the genome assembly itself, uh, so far we've generated uh, PacBio continuous long reads data with about 84x coverage. Uh, we were able to do uh, Illumina RNA sequencing on eight different tissues, which uh, we're hopeful to use for uh, annotation. Um, and then we've also ordered Hi-C, and we had an issue in our uh, lab, so we had to reorder it, and it's currently on the machine now. So I'm excited to get that going. As far as the assembly statistics so far, which we used Canoe for, so shout out to uh, Sergey Karen, who's also um, a participant today. Uh, we have a, about a 600 megabase genome, and we were able to uh, just straight out of Canoe with no extra filtering or anything get uh, seven and a half megabase N50, uh, NG50, um, and an area under the N curve of about nine million. And so we were uh, pretty happy with that to start with, and we're excited to see you know where it goes from here. Um, so as far as the results from this and the next steps, certainly with the genome, we have high C planned in the works, um, and we plan to annotate and release that data. Um, more on the population genomics side, we've, uh, the analysis has revealed that even though these fish are large bodied and capable of traveling across the Indo-Pacific barrier, uh, they don't. Uh, we're not entirely sure why, but that's what the evidence reveals. And we've also seen population structure in Hawaii. And so our initial recommendations uh, because of this work has been uh, to put precautionary management measures in place until we can really get out what's going on. Um, then, of course, you know, we'll be able to move forward and do that in future work. But uh, that's where it's at so far. And I appreciate your time uh, listening. I just want to acknowledge um, my advisors and uh, collaborators. Perry and Keone, and then Jessica, who works at the South African Institute for Aquatic Diversity, uh, who's helped with the population genomics side of this analysis. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you outside of you know, this, because we don't have questions.